want to give everybody a little introduction as to how we got here this morning, how I got here this morning. Back in January, I was talking with Pastor Mark, and the Connect classes or the Sunday school was going to have a special service that they were going to do on March the 29th. It involved some activities they were going to do down in the church fellowship hall, and and, uh, they were wanting the pastors to participate in that also, as well as some of the families of the students. And and I was talking with Pastor Mark, and I said, well, if, if you and Pastor David would like to attend that, I'll be glad to do the service if you need someone to do it. And he said, that would be great. That would be great. If you could do the service on March the 29th, the both services, that would really be great. And I said, okay, this was in January. So if you know anything about me, by the end of January, my, I'm, re- I'm done. I'm ready to go. And uh, my topic was going to be the Bible, God's holy book. And then everything was coming together so well. In fact, Carolyn Miller did her mission moment on March the 2nd, if you remember. And she said, our mission for the month of March is we're going to collect for the Bible bank. And I'd like everyone to bring their Bible banks back at the end of March, which was March the 29th. And I'm going, boy, this is wonderful, Lord. I'm going to be talking about the Bible. We're going to be bringing the Bible banks back at the end of March. This couldn't be more perfect. Well, as you know, that uh, didn't quite happen that way. We had some little uh, virus come along and kind of knock plans kind of crazy. And of course, we didn't have church here for a number of weeks until June. And so I I talked to Mark and I said, uh, I don't think I probably should do my message. And he said, no, that, yeah, well, I said, I'll just put it on the sidelines. And, And if you ever need me again to do something, maybe I can use it. Well, lo and behold, the end of June, Mark calls me up and says, uh, Hey, I'm going to be on vacation on April, on August. Excuse me, August the second. Would you? Could you possibly do it? And, and and at that time, Pastor David somehow was also going to be on vacation on August the second. Uh, would you be able to do the service? And I said, uh, Yeah, I already got it done. I mean, I just used the one I was going to use earlier. Well, uh, so that's how we kind of got here. And then two weeks ago, I was talking with Carolyn. I said, Carolyn, could you do another plea for the Bible Bank? which she did two weeks ago, and said, we're going to collect them. I see a few of them back there by the offering plates. In fact, when I was going to do the service on March the 29th, I was actually going to have a Bible bank inside the offering plates. That way, if you forgot your bank and you wanted to throw some extra a check in there, some cash in there, you could do so. So that's kind of how we got to where we are today on both the Bible banks and, and me doing the service today. So we're going to talk about the Bible, God's holy book. If I go to the concordance of my Bible, which is the back of my black Bible there, and I look up the word Bible, it says, see scripture. Okay? So I looked up the word scripture, and there was 55 references of what the Bible says about itself. And so I looked up all 55 of those references, And I wrote down eight of them here that I just want to briefly mention quickly to you this morning that caught my eye. The Bible. You can't know it unless you read it. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and 2 Chronicles chapter 34. The Bible. It must be put into practice. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23. I like this one. The Bible. Don't ignore the parts that make you uncomfortable. It tells us in Jeremiah 26, verse 2. The Bible, knowing it, but not living it. It tells us in Matthew 23, verses 5 through 7. The Bible, its truth never changes. It tells us in Mark 13, 31. The Bible, ignoring it, is neglecting God. It tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, which is what David read. The Bible, it reveals who we are and what we are not. In Hebrews 4.12, and the Bible is relevant to all ages. It tells us in 1 John 2.12-14. Now, with 
this pandemic, more people have purchased Bibles. One of the things I've kind of read after I had this message put together is that Bible sales have kind of gone through the, gone through the roof in the month of April. Alabaster, which is a company which serves Instagram, said their sales for the Bible was up 143% in April versus a year ago. Lifeway Christian Resources said the same thing. Their sales were up 66%. And Tyndale said their study Bibles, which are a more elaborate Bible with footnotes and stuff, was up 44%. You know the Bibles all around our church? right up there on the altar. Until this pandemic, it used to be at least two or three in the pews right in front of you where the hymnals and the Bibles were. I bet if I go back and Pastor Mark or Pastor David's office, I might find some Bibles. If I go in the classrooms where our Connect classes, our Sunday school students are, there are Bibles. It's all around our church. And you know the Bible's all around my home. I have a Bible that I got when Brenda and me were married. It's on the nightstand right next to my bed. If I open the drawers to that nightstand, I have several Bibles that I earned as a Sunday school student, memorizing different things. When I was confirmed, I got a Bible. Brenda got Bibles the same way. If I go to my, in my office, this black Bible sits on there that I try to read every day along with the Bible Brenda has there. And if I go to the bookshelf right alongside of me, there's other Bibles. I counted 20. Some of them are just New Testament. Some of them are just Psalms and Proverbs. But 20 Bibles. Now, that's not counting the Bibles that my parents had or my grandparents have that are in the basement of my house. They're stored away. Some are in another language. I can't even read them. There was a book written somewhat about my family. It's called Born in the Country. It was written by a gentleman by the name of Roger Taylor. His brother, Harold Taylor, was a teacher that I had at Melville High School, but his mother was a Frankie. And he wrote a book about the history of our, our family. And I found in this book a very interesting sentence concerns my great-great-grandfather, whose name was Carl Frankie. He, came, he was born in 1837. He came to America in the late 1850s. Listen to this sentence in this book. Once he got here, talking about coming to the St. Louis area, he followed a man carrying a Bible into a church where he was surprised to meet relatives from back home. Followed a man carrying a Bible. The other thing I like about this, this picture of my great-great-grandfather is you can't see it here, but he's wearing a tie. So... Uh, it seems kind of the way it goes in the family sometimes. Uh, why do we cherish this book? Why do we choose to believe what's in the book? I was reading a book in preparation of the service called One Foundation. Essays on the Sufficiency of Scripture. It's written by various, various people. And I want to read the very first paragraph on chapter 4 that was written by John MacArthur. And it says these words. Psalm 19 is the earliest biblical text that gives us a comprehensive statement on the superiority of Scripture. It categorically affirms the authority, inerrancy, and sufficiency of the written word of God. It does this by comparing the truth of Scripture to the breathtaking grandeur of the universe, and it declares that the Bible is a better revelation of God than all the glory of the galaxies. Scripture, it proclaims, is perfect in every regard.
Psalm 19 is basically a more comprehensive and shorter version of Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible. If someone challenges you, why don't you learn the longest chapter in the Bible? You have 176 verses to learn in Psalm 119. And Psalm 19, in just eight verses, condenses that into more concise comment. And what was Psalm 19, 7 through 9? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. In his essay, John MacArthur says, these verses make six statements, two in verse 7, two in verse 8, and two in verse 9. He uses six titles for scripture. It's perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, and sure. It lists six characteristics of scripture. It's perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, and sure, and it names six effects of scripture on the human soul. It revives the heart, makes wise the simple, gives joy to the heart, gives light to the eyes, endures forever, and produces comprehensive righteousness. And notice all six of these statements have the phrase, of the Lord, in case someone might want to question the source of Scripture. This is the law of the Lord. It's his testimony. It's the inspired revelation of the Lord God. And as we look at each phrase, we begin to sense the power and the greatness of Scripture. Remember, the central point of this whole psalm is that the grandeur and glory of Scripture is infinitely greater than the entire created universe. Let's look at the first one. God's word is perfect, reviving the soul. It says that at the beginning of verse 7. Psalm 119, verse 30 says, I have chosen the way of truth. I have set my heart on your laws. In the New Testament book, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is God's instruction for life. It's perfect. It contains everything we need to know about God, his glory, faith, and the way to salvation. Scripture is not deficient in any way. It is perfect in both accuracy and sufficiency. It is perfect in its ability to restore and transform the human heart. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. You know, for believers, this piercing soul work is described here as really a beneficial procedure. It's like spiritual heart surgery. The instrument that God uses in this process is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now the second point, God's Word is trustworthy, imparting wisdom. It says the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Scripture, again, is God's testimony. A testimony is a personal account of a reliable witness. Eyewitnesses give testimony, sworn testimony in court. Believers relate to how they came to faith, and we call that their testimony. 
The Bible is God's own account of who he is and what he is like. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. That's its central characteristic. The word of God has the effect of making simple minds wise. It teaches discernment. And biblical wisdom is about prudent living. The word wise describes someone who walks and acts sensibly and virtuously. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. The totally self-reliant person is doomed. The truly wise person recognizes what is good and right and then applies the simple truth to his everyday life. In other words, wisdom in this view has everything to do with truth, honor, virtue, and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the beginning of verse 8 says, God's word is right, causing joy. The the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Precepts means principles for instruction. This includes the principles that govern our character and conduct, as well as shaping our convictions and our confessions of faith. It covers every biblical ordinance governing righteous behavior. The word right in the Hebrew language means straight or undeviating. It has the connotation of alignment and perfect order. The implication is that the precepts of Scripture keeps a person going in the right direction, straight to the target. The result? is joy. The life-giving, life-changing power mentioned in verse 7 is the reason for the joy mentioned in verse 8. David knew that joy, and so did the author of Psalm 119 in verses 45 to 48, in which David referenced verse 47 in in his prayer. It says this, I will walk about in freedom, For I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings, and I will not be put to shame. For I delight in your commands because I love them. I lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and I meditate on your decrees. The joyful heart is one of the key reasons scripture is even given to believers. On the night that before he died, Jesus told his disciples these words in John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that joy may be complete. The fourth item is God's word is pure, enlightening the eyes. The scripture said the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. You do not have to have an advanced intelligence or superhuman skill to understand the basic truth of the Bible. As a rule, Scripture is simply not too hard to understand. Again, the author of Psalm 119 makes this point in verse 130. It says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. God's commandments are clear. If they were not, 
They would be pointless. How could he hold us responsible for something we couldn't possibly understand? Scripture is clear, enlightening the eyes. You know the late and famous author Mark Twain, who was an agnostic, he was not a believer, has been quoted these words concerning the Bible. He says, it's not the things I don't understand in the Bible that bother me. It's the things I do understand. The problem for unbelievers is not that the Bible isn't clear. They just don't want to follow what it has to say. Now, fifth, God's word is clean, enduring forever. The verse 9 starts out, The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The Bible is a perfect manual on worship. As a manifesto on worship, the Hebrew word clean or pure is used more than 90 times in the Old Testament to speak of ceremonial cleanliness. It means no impurity, defilement, or imperfection of any kind in Scripture. God's word is without corruption, hence it is without error. David makes this point in Psalm 12, verse 6, which says, The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace, purified seven times. If Pastor Mark was here, and he had on his chemist, his old chemist hat, where he used to be before he became a pastor, he would say these words, there is no dross, there is no blemish, there is no foreign element. It would be hard to find a more emphatic statement on the biblical inerrancy in all the Bible. The proof of this absolute perfection is that the Word of God endures forever. It never changes. You all have heard the verse in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. You've all have heard these words. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of God stands forever. Jesus, in Matthew 24, verse 35, said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Finally, our final item to look at is God's word is true, true, altogether righteous. The end of verse 9 says, The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Ordinances are judgment, means verdict. Scripture is the divine magistrate's verdict on everything that pertains to life and godliness. When Scripture speaks, It is conclusive because it is God's own verdict. Again, Psalm 119, verse 160 says, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. This is what Scripture claims for itself. It is Jesus' own view of Scripture. Jesus, in praying for his disciples to the Father, in the book of John, chapter 17, verse, chapter 7, verse 17, said these words, Satisfy them, he's talking about his disciples, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. 
The central key point in Psalm 19 is that Scripture is not only true, inerrant, and authoritative, it is also sufficient. It gives us every truth that really matters. Scripture is eternally true, always applicable, and perfectly sufficient to meet all of our spiritual needs. Now, when I was preparing this message at my home, I went through some of my files, and I came across a magazine, Decision Magazine, that's put out by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And I said, hmm, this says July, August 2006. Why I kept it? Not sure, except the Lord wanted me to read it again, because the title of it is, The Authority of the Bible. Why we can trust it. Why we must obey it. These 40 pages are filled with articles by various people on the authority and reliability of the Bible. Also, in the month of April, I was at my mother-in-law's house, and she grew up uh, close to where my farm is, uh, down in Sligo, Missouri, but she grew up, and she still gets the newspaper from Steelville, because she knows some people in there, and she wants to keep up on what things are going on. And I just don't normally look at that paper, but I was at the house one day, and I was paging through it, and I came across this little thing under the lost and found. And the title of it is Lost. $100 reward. Black Bible. What a zipper. This isn't it, but that's Black Bible with a zipper. Given to a person from his mother. Lost in the vicinity of Oak Hill, Highway CC, north of Cuba. Please call this number. Most all of you have Bibles at home. You might not have 20, you might have 50, I don't know. But I hope you take the time to read it. Study it. Meditate it on it. Memorize it. It had been over 50 years since I had memorized an entire chapter of the Bible. I did that when I was in Sunday school and got different awards for that. And I've learned other verses, but I've never learned entire chapters. And when I knew I was doing the service here on August the 2nd, the Lord placed in my heart, he said, you need to memorize Psalm 19. For the past month, I've been saying that psalm about four or five times. <laughs> I'd wake up at night, I'd say it, I'd wake up at whatever. During the daytime, I'd say it. God's word is powerful. It should impact your life. Your life should reflect things that are in this book. No, we're not perfect. But we should strive to be so. Okay. Again, today we are making a collection for the Bible League. For every $5 that the Bible League collects, they send a Bible to a persecuted person in another country that can't afford one. It's a great cause. If you haven't given, you might consider doing so in the back on the offering plate when you leave. But if your Bible's at home, take them out and read them. This powerful stuff, God's holy word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you how you have given us your word, the Bible. Help us to read, study, meditate and apply your words as we continue to grow in our Christian walk and model these concepts as a witness in our everyday life for others to see and to ask us about the joy that we have and we exhibit. 
We give you all the glory and praise. Amen.